I thank the elders here at Hillview Terrace and the lectureship committee for inviting me to contribute to the program this year. And I want to thank Andy and Denver for their direction and thank Emmanuel and Judy for letting me stay. Someone once said that home is where when you go there, they have to let you in. They had to and they did and I can't uh, tell you how much Emmanuel and Judy have meant to me in my uh, life as a Christian and as a minister and as their outlaw uh, son-in-law. Last week, I met the wife of a combat wounded veteran. He stepped on an IED in Iraq and lost both of his legs. Probably in the Vietnam War era, he would not have survived because as time goes on, the rate of mortality for troops in combat continues to go down. And one reason is because of battlefield triage. Triage is a system of assigning and evaluating medical treatment. And very crudely, a medic in the battlefield uses a simple filter to treat the wounded, to sort them out. There are those who will die anyway there are those who will live anyway, and then a third group are those who will only live if they receive urgent and prompt attention. Triage is an important discipline. And I always wonder in a letter like 1 Corinthians, when it was composed, if something like triage happened. Corinth was a mess. It had doctrinal and relational and moral issues. Which would come first? You know how Paul begins. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. I'm not sure that they could get anything else right until they got that right. Maybe there was an order and a sequence and priority there. We are turning our attention to the ethics of personal relationships now. In particular, the article in chapter six, loose litigation. I call your attention now to that reading. Beginning at verse one. Dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then you have judgments concerning things pertaining to this life, do you appoint those who are least esteemed by the church to judge? I say this to your shame. Is it so? that there is not a wise man among you, not even one, who will be able to judge between his brethren? But brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. Now therefore, it is already an utter failure that you go to law against one another. Why do you not rather accept wrong? Why would, do you not rather let yourselves be cheated? No, you yourselves do wrong and cheat, and you do these things to your brethren. Before we get to um, our assigned text, I want to, uh, to take a moment and recognize patterns here. As has already been noted, 1 Corinthians was generated by a situation in the Church of Christ at Corinth. Two sources or streams inform Paul's response in the letter. The first is some kind of first-hand report brought to him from on-site at Corinth. He mentions Chloe's household in chapter 111, and there's a roster in chapter 16, 17. And in the uh, article on the Lord's Supper, he also talks about him hearing things, like church grapevine chatter. So there were these oral reports brought to him. The second stream or source that informed Paul is a letter that the Corinthians had written to Paul 
which he talks about in chapter 7, verse 1. Now concerning the things about which you wrote to me. The letter then by structure is, is kind of cut in half at chapter 7, verse 1. In the first half, Paul mainly is responding to those issues brought to him by the oral reports, what he had heard. From chapter 7, verse 1 forward, Paul mainly is responding to those questions that were asked of him by the Corinthians themselves. So chapter 6 then has an assignment. This particular part of the epistle has a requirement. It must make the transition. It must bridge from the first half to the second half. Paul has to get the reader from one place to the next, and this transition must be smooth. Now, the subject of chapters 5 and 6 is sexual immorality. The translation of the Greek word porneia, where we get to our word pornography. It, that term itself is found eight times in chapters 5 and 6. It's a generic word used to talk cate categorically of the vice, and we're not surprised as readers with the Corinthians having problems with porneia, and someone else in the program has already addressed that. I mention it because of the pattern. Paul finishes the first half in chapters 5 and 6 with porneia, and then he opens in chapter 7, verse 1, the first question he answers is marriage, and he uses the term, because of porneia, or sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife, let each woman have her own husband, chapter 7 and verse 2. So our chapter then accomplishes the purpose. It achieves the transition. It smooths the area here, all under this umbrella of porneia. And that all bothered me when I got to my passage, because my assignment is the lawsuits. And I wonder, how, how is Paul arguing here? What is the connective tissue between my text, chapter 6, 1 through 8, and the surrounding material? You see, um, this is a little curious, that Paul, in chapter 5, 1 through 13, censures the church for a case of porneia. Then, chapter 6, my assignment, 1 through 11, he censures the church for loose litigation, and then he reverts back to the subject of porneia in chapter 6, 12, and forward, with connection probably to temple prostitution, and then with connection to marriage. So what the result is almost a sandwich with this teaching on lawsuits embedded in a porneia discourse. So doesn't that kind of break up the unity of the sexual immorality discourse? What is exactly is its placement here? Well, we should recognize that we have some limitations. We don't know everything. So however the Holy Spirit here through Paul is arguing, the Corinthians could follow it. There may be some things we miss. That said, there are at least um, three main explanations. One is that this lawsuit teaching is it's just an island. It doesn't really connect anything before and after. It's kind of a digression. Uh, I don't think that that's the case. The second view is that this lawsuit teaching is connected to the material around it in the matter of porneia. Some have suggested that the legal matter is somehow tangled up in the public case of sexual immorality. So has the matter of porneia now become a matter of law? Well, I don't think that's the case. For one main reason is in the letter about the law, in the article about the lawsuits, Paul calls it insignificant. And he doesn't deal with the case of porneia, either in the immoral brother in five or following in temple prostitution as if it is insignificant. I don't think he's equating the two. So the third possibility um, is, and this is the way I understand it, is that the case of the lawsuits is connected to the teaching on the immoral brother in the matter of, of judgment. 
See, Paul was flabbergasted by the church and this publicly immoral brother, not so much by the brother's behavior, but by the church's lack of ambition and awareness to judge it. And so Paul simply uses the lawsuits as another example of how they are too immature to judge. He is confronting them in chapter 5 because they lack the initiative to police themselves, to keep this matter in house and not air their dirty laundry in the community where the gospel is compromised. And he then moves naturally to the next case in which they are displaying that lack of maturity. So I think here Paul is fixing internal control. He moves naturally from the lawsuit, from the pornea to the lawsuits. That is, the lawsuits is an illustration of their lack of judgment, their lack of ability to judge themselves. He uses judge in my text seven times. So we're going to read this, uh, this uh, article on lawsuits as it is subordinate to, it's connected to the case of Pornea. When Paul says to finish in chapter 5, 12, do you not judge those who are inside? They don't. Our text is subordinate to that in that this is a way for Paul to prove they lack the maturity, the heart, the guts, and the brains to judge themselves. They have no mechanism in place to police themselves. They lack that ambition, that maturity, that skill, and they lack something else too. But we should um, get to the reading. The, um, the text in the Greek has 12 sentences in chapter 6, 1 through 8, and nine of them are questions. And that alone gives us a key to the strategy here. These questions answer themselves. They aren't really asked looking for an answer. Rather, they are asked for effect. Paul hangs his persuasion here in this matter on the rhetorical force of these questions. And these, a question kind of draws the reader in to the thinking. You know, when you were in um, school and you were daydreaming and the teacher said, isn't that right, Brad? <laughs> the teacher asks questions often to keep you logged in, to keep you connected. To, to kind of bring you into the conversation and the, the reasoning and the argument. So that's what's happening here as Paul is asking these questions. He is using it as a device to draw them in to his thinking. <clears throat> and the opening line tells the problem. Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? In litigation, we may think first of the personal injury attorney that we saw on the commercial this morning during news. Now, of course, the ancient Greco-Roman society did not have the uh, have you been injured commercials, but they did have litigation. Roman law allowed for civil suits to be brought by both foreigners and citizens. These civil cases were brought before a praetor who was an elected magistrate. This elected magistrate had the, had the legal power to administer law on behalf of the state or the empire whenever plaintiffs would bring a case against the defendant. And that's what's happening. Here are church members, here are fellow Christians, brothers, who are taking these lawsuits into the courts, and everyone sees and knows. And Paul, by the questions, his tone even comes through, almost. You know, one thing we miss sometimes in the text is a tone of voice. But his tone almost comes through. He's disgusted with them. And in fact, listen to chapter 7, or, or verse 7. It is already an utter failure that you go to law against one another. He really doesn't get very far in his talk. He doesn't 
actually intellectually advance very far in his argument here. He kind of just spins and drops his hands and rants at them for bringing these cases before the Roman courts instead of relying upon even one wise man among you who can mediate the matter. So he elaborates here. Do you not know? He uses that formula twice. This is a favorite expression of Paul. Do you not know that as many of us have, as have been baptized into Christ, you see that expression, do you not know? That formula Paul uses, and he uses it here twice. Do you not know that the saints would judge the world? Do you not know that we will judge angels? He assigns here some kind of um, celestial, even cosmic jurisdiction to the church. He, he tells them, your administration extends to the world and to angels. Can't you handle this insignificant matter? Can't you keep this in house? Can't you police yourself with this dispute with these two brothers bickering? Now, <clears throat> the judging the world and the judging angels, of course, what does it mean to say that we will judge the world and judge the angels? Well, further revelation is lacking. Uh, and I don't have any more revelation in my Bible than you have in yours. But I think, as most commentaries note, that Hebrews chapter 11, 7 is helpful. When it says that when Noah built the ark, he condemned the world in righteousness. In fact, the same word translated condemned there is a root of this same word judge in our text. I think we can connect those dots in that the way we judge the world and angels may be because of our obedient faith, it provides a contrasting backdrop to the world and to angels. And their flaw, their unbelief, their disobedience can be seen. Suppose a Josh Ball comes to his teacher at the end of the semester with the grade D minus in his hand and says, look, you expected too much. The material is overwhelming. Your demand, you, you're way too demanding as a teacher, Terry. You expect too much from us. Terry might say, when well, now Josh, there are nine people in the class and I gave out six B's and two A's, and you're D minus. And five of the other students in the class have wives and children at home, yet they were able to wring a D or an a, a, a B or an A out of this class. So by those other students performing, they judged or condemned Josh. He had no leg to stand on. It provides a benchmark, a standard, a measure, a grade. And so for us to the world and angels, provide that. Because the world or the sinning angels, 2 Peter 2, 4, may say to God on that day, expecting too much. You went too far, too demanding. And God will look at the faithful saints and say, well, they had less going for them than you did. They made it. They believed me. They obeyed. Now, verse 4, the sense is, if you are this, if you outrank the world by way of uh, um, judgment, jurisdiction, why are you appealing, then, to that lower court? Why would you appeal to that lower court in these matters when you have the asset yourself? See, there's an incongruence here between what this church is and what this church thinks it is. This church doesn't know the Corinthians 
did not realize who they were. That they were able to handle this. Is this so? He says, has it come to this? This is their deficit. You don't even have one wise man among you? Not even one, you see the emphatic, not even one who can handle this matter? Not even one? No, but brother goes to brother, to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. And here's their utter failure. You, you go to law against one another. See, that, that's, a, that's a reciprocal thing there. You're going to law against each other. You, you, see, you see the utter failure of that? I, I mean, I could take Becky, my wife, to court and sue her for some reason because of a, a bad meal. And the judge could award me damages. $250 because you burnt the eggs. Case dismissed. Well, where's that $250 going to come from? We have a joint account. <laughs> it would make no sense. I wouldn't advance my cause. It'd be an utter failure. And so here, Paul says, you don't realize your relationship. You don't realize the corporation there. You are the body of Christ. There's connective tissue between you. You don't get it. You're going to law against one another. Where do you think that's going to come from? Who do you think is going to hurt for that? Who's going to suffer for that? Who's going to feel that? Where's that debt going to come from? You, you're going to law against one another. And then remarkably, uh, Paul pulls this rabbit out of the hat. He proposes a third way to handle their bickering, this whatever, this concrete lawsuit, this case. He says, rather than, rather than drag it publicly into the pagan court, rather than appealing to one wise man in the church, police yourself, keep it in-house, and let him arbitrate it, here is an outrageous proposition Paul makes. Why? Why do you not rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated? No. You not only don't let yourself be wronged, you commit wrong. You're not even not letting yourself be cheated. You are doing the cheating. And it's your own brother. This third course, not the pagan courts, not a brother to mediate the dispute, but you accept the wrong. That's Paul's preference. And I would argue that's the course compelled by love. The title of lectures this hour is The Ethics of the Redeemed. Love is the grandfather ethic for the Christian faith. It's the one moral absolute. Love is the ethical spine, not only of 1 Corinthians, but the entire New Testament. Owe no man anything, anything except to love another. For he who loves has fulfilled the law. Romans 13, 8. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. 1 Corinthians 8, 1. And is the greatest of all. 1 Corinthians 13, 13. Through your love, serve one another. 
For all the law is fulfilled in this one word that you should love your neighbor as yourself, Galatians 5.13. Walk in love, Ephesians 5.2. Have the same love, Philippians 2.2. 2. Above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, Colossians chapter 3, verse 14. You yourselves are taught by God to love one another, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 9. Let brotherly love continue, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 1. Above all these things, have fervent love for the brethren. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God. He who loves has been born of God and knows God. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. And Paul clarifies the loving course of action at this ethical fork in the road. He says, you want to do the loving thing? Here's the loving thing. What if a brother could make a mark on the soul of his adversary by not pursuing the case? Suppose he has a good one. Suppose this Christian occupies the position of legal advantage. He can take it and run with it, but he lets himself be cheated because there's something higher. Because he wants to animate the gospel. There's a Ghanaian proverb and it goes like this. <clears throat> a beautiful cloth does not wear itself. Now, I might translate it like this. A, um, a dress may be pretty on the rack at the store or in the window, but I'd much rather see its drape and movement when my wife is wearing it. See, we preach the gospel. We advertise it in the window. We proclaim it. But the world wants to see the gospel animated by church members. We've got to put it on. How does your church wear the gospel? The ethic of love. How does the ethic of love drape and move in your life? We sing the songs. We make the claims. See, we say, I'd give my life. I'd give my life. We pray it. We teach it. It's in our hymns. We'd give our life. But let me tell you, if I wouldn't give up my ego or my rights or some cash, what makes you think I'd give up my life? What makes you think I would give up my life? Look, this is really the first thing we learn as Christians. Jesus loves me. This I know. This is the first light that comes on. It's the first thing we know. Because of that, it should be the, it should be the thing we're growing up in the most. It should be the thing we do the best because we've known it and been doing it longer. We should be really good at this. I don't know that we are. How many? How many Christians would do this? Would you let yourself be wronged? Would you eat it? Would you put your ego on the back burner? Would you not claim your rights? Would you let yourself be injured or cheated? Well, now, I'm not going to be taken advantage of. I'm not going to be called naive or gullible. There are worse things in life than being taken advantage of, than being called gullible or naive. 
And there are more rewarding things than winning a lawsuit case. Why would someone? Who would? Who would let themselves be injured? Who would let themselves be wronged? Who would let themselves be cheated? And so publicly, I know one who did, very innocently, let himself be wrong, let himself be injured, let himself be cheated. Maybe a Christian can. Maybe he can. Maybe she can make a mark on the soul of her adversary by giving up the right, by letting herself be wrong, by letting herself be cheated. Ah, uh, I don't know about that. Someone says, that's awful risky. Well, love always is risky. You can't love and not risk. You always risk when you love. Always. So, so, the, so will you then take the risk? Will you risk giving up and maybe not getting back? Will you risk giving all and getting nothing back? what Jesus did and maybe we should be more like him I think maybe that's our reason for being here anyway he did he gave all maybe here this after this morning and you've never claimed Christ maybe you are walking without him Maybe you are not a Christian. And if you have read and understand the gospel, what God did for you in giving Jesus for you, and this morning you um, want to confess that you believe Jesus is who he claimed to be, the Christ, the Son of God, God will honor the repentance in your heart as you desire to change and turn to him. And we can baptize you you can share in Jesus dying and rising, walk a new life, responding to this great event where God himself allowed man to wrong him, to cheat him, to injure him for some greater good, and then use that as a pattern, a model for our lives to copy. If you're here as a Christian and you need the prayers of your spiritual family, then we are here ready to pray for you also. If you have a need, we ask you to come while we stand and sing to encourage you.